In this video, I want to talk about generalised least squares. So this is a viable alternative to ordinary least squares under the conditions that I have heteroscedasticity in my model or in my population. Okay, so what does generalised least squares actually mean? So let's say I have some model where I is equal to alpha plus beta xi plus our sort of stochastic error ei. And instead of specifying the sort of normal conditions which we do under the Gauss-Markov, namely that of homoscedastic errors and no serial correlation, I'm now going to specify another two conditions on this particular error. Namely that the variance of this error term EI, given my sort of x variable, given my independent variable, is given by some sort of function of xi, which in general doesn't equal just some constant. So that would be the case whereby we had homoscedastic errors. And secondly, I'm also going to specify that there is some sort of covariance structure between errors. So there is a covariance between EI and let's say EJ, which in general doesn't equal zero for some I which doesn't equal J. And these two things together basically say that the first one says that we have heteroscedastic errors and the second one says that we have some degree of zero correlation of errors. And technically, generalised least squares, if you know both of these sort of functional forms here, generalised least squares is a way of taking this extra information into account when we sort of arrive at our estimates for alpha and beta. And it is a better way of doing things than for least squares because this method turns out to be more efficient. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, weighted least squares because of the fact that it, at sort of most undergraduate levels, you don't need to know about generalised least squares in detail. You only need to know about a particular subset, which we call weighted least squares. And weighted least squares relaxes one of these two assumptions, the second one to be specific. So the second one goes, and actually the covariance between EI and EJ is equal to zero, just like we assumed under the Gauss-Markov condition. But we still have this heteroscedasticity term here, which says that the variance of EI given XI in principle doesn't just equal some constant. So in weighted least squares, an example might be if we were to assume that the variance of, let's say, our sort of error term given our XI is equal to sigma squared. So that's a positive constant times our independent variable XI. So that would be one of the well, that would be the sort of condition on our errors which we need to be able to estimate our weighted least squares model. Okay, so let's think about what this actually looks like in practice. If I was to draw a graph of yi against my xi, and I was to sort of mark on some points here, then if we assume that beta is greater than zero, then as yi increases, or sorry, as xi increases why i tends to increase but not only that our points tend to become more spread out so if we were sort of thinking about drawing the population regression line perhaps it would look something like this so i've, I've tried to draw that there as going through the center of our points okay so that's the population regression line and let's think about what happens if we try and estimate this particular situation via least squares okay so Let's think about our sort of domain of our sort of yi and xi as being separated by sort of two distinct areas. So if I sort of redraw these points on here like I did before, so what we're having here again is that as my xi increases, my sort of variance of yi increases. Yeah, so I've got something like that. And if I sort of think about breaking this down into two different areas, I can sort of think about it in terms of region one and region two. And let's think about the differences between these two regions. Well, region one, there's a much smaller variance in yi, right? Because if I draw, let's say, a uh, OLS line or a weighted least squares line, then the idea is that it will probably go through the sort of center of these points and the sort of distances of points away from the line in region one tend to be less than they are in region two. So this is sort of low variance and the second region is high variance. 
Okay, and so I've sort of assumed implicitly that there is some original line which we've drawn, which is either sort of weighted least squares or OLS. I'm just going to assume that they happen to come out with the same values of alpha and beta to begin with. And now I'm going to think about what happens if I add an extra point to my sort of sample. Uh, first of all, let's think about if I added an extra point in the sort of low variance region. So let's say I hadn't added an extra point, which was here. Well, how much notice should I take of that point? Or rather, how much should I adjust my line of best fit to take into account this extra point? Well, the fact is that this extra point, actually, let me just redraw this extra point so it's a bit further away. Because it's in region one, we know that region one is essentially a low variance region. So in this region, our points tend to be quite close to the line. So because we know it's a low variance region, then we should probably adjust our least squared line quite a lot. So perhaps my new least squared line goes something like this, right? So that's a sort of intuition for what we should be doing. Okay, so that's what happens if I add a point in region one. What happens if I add a sort of similar point in region two, which is a sort of similar distance away from the line? So let's say I add an extra point here. How much should I adjust my line of best fit to take into account this extra information? Well, this extra point has been added in a high variance region. So we know that there is in general going to be quite a large spread of points away from the line here. So just because I've got one extra point that tends to be quite a lot further away from my original line of best fit, that doesn't mean I should necessarily change my line of best fit that much. So perhaps I just adjust it only a little bit. So perhaps it just changes to something like that. Okay, so I've kind of talked about the intuition for what we should do when we're drawing a line of best fit. And it actually turns out that this intuition is exactly that which the weighted least squares methodology follows. So if we sort of thought about drawing our weighted least squares line, then it would be pretty close to that, which we just, just sort of talked through, given this extra point here. If we compare that with what least squared or ordinary least squares methodology does, well, in ordinary least squares methodology, it regards all sort of deviations of points from the line, uh, if they have the same sort of distance, as equal. So a, a point this far below the line in region two is regarded equal to a sort of point in this far away from the line in region one. So those two sort of deviations are regarded exactly the same. But we know that we shouldn't do that because region one actually has a much lower variance than region two. So we, could, we should actually give much less weight to this point here than we should do for some sort of other point which we have uh, sort of equidistant from the line in region one. So in, in this particular point here, we should give that high weighting. So I'm going to write an H there. And this point here, we should give a low rating. So a low weighting when we're sort of calculating our line of best fit. So when we're drawing a line of best fit, we are trying to estimate alpha and beta because that affects the slope and the y-intercept of our line. Okay, so that's what weighted least squares does. Ordinary least squares just says, I'm just going to give both of these two points equal weighting. And so my least squared line in this particular circumstance where I've only got this sort of low, this, this extra point in the sort of high variance region added will actually be tend to be that much more towards that point than the weighted least squares line is. So this sort of second line here is that which will be achieved by weighted least squares. And this third sort of line here, if you can make it out, is that which we would get from ordinary least squares. So the benefit of using weighted least squares over ordinary least squares is that it takes into account this extra information and it says, well, if I have points in a higher variance region, which tend to be further away from my line, then I should give them less weight. And that turns out in many applications to be a very sensible thing to do. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the mathematics behind weighted least squares. I'll see you then.